you'll find out very quickly that modern day Catholic Protestant Orthodox tradition that has been the prevailing view for almost two millennia is really a Christianity in disguise. In the book one or three, in some of the more renowned ancient church fathers and modern theologians, a certain embarrassment can be sensed with respect to the number three, whereas others emphasize it in such an uninhibited way that for all intents and purposes, one would have to speak of a tritheism. Augustine on the Trinity, he wrote that the word person is to be used relatively. In this way, we should say three persons, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, just as we speak of three friends or three relations or three neighbors, in that they are so mutually, not that each one of them is so in respect to himself. This is because these names have a relative signification. For example, in the Trinity, when we speak of the person of the Father, we mean to talk about the substance of the Father. So why don't we call all three together one person instead of three persons? Because we wish some one word to serve for that meaning whereby the Trinity is understood that we might not be altogether silent when asked, what three? While we confess that they are three. Harvard professor Dr. Wolfson, The Philosophy of the Church Fathers, the question, how can three beings, each of them a God, constitute one God? To the Church Fathers, that was a mystery, which they tried, if not to solve, at least to free from the charge of its being self-contradictory and meaningless, and this by showing how philosophers, in a variety of ways, justified the common practice of designating the many by the term one, and if, therefore, they're still to be regarded as one, some new interpretation has to be given to the concept of the unity of God. An explanation was found based upon Aristotle's discussion of relative unity, where the term one is a relative term. The result was a combination of Jewish monotheism and pagan polytheism except that to them, that is the church fathers, this combination was a good combination. In fact, it was to them an ideal combination of what is best in Jewish monotheism, which would be the Shema Israel, and of what is best in pagan polytheism. And consequently, they gloried in it and pointed to it as evidence of their belief. Dr. Wolfson goes on to quote one of the so-called Cappadocian fathers, Gregory of Nyssa. The truth passes in the mean between these two conceptions, destroying each heresy and yet accepting what's useful to it from each. The Jewish dogma is destroyed, that is the Shema, while the polytheistic error of the Greek school is made to vanish by the unity of the nature abrogating this imagination of plurality. And then he quotes from another later so-called church father, John of Damascus. On the one hand, of the Jewish idea, we have the unity of God's nature. And on the other, of the Greek, we have the distinction of hypostasis, that is, persons, and that only. To shed further light on this, we have the noted church historian Philip Schaff, History of the Christian Church, Volume 3. The Trinity forms a bulwark against heathen polytheism on the one hand and Jewish deism and abstract monotheism on the other. It avoids the errors and combines the truth of these two opposite conceptions. It also formed the true mean between Sabellianism and tritheism, both of which taught a divine triad, but at the expense, in the one case, of the personal distinctions, in the other, of the essential unity. It exerted a wholesome regulative influence on the other dogmas. Many passages of the Nicene Fathers have unquestionably a tritheistic sound, but are neutralized by others which by themselves may bear a Sabellian construction, so that their position must be regarded as midway between these two extremes. So I have always called the doctrine of the Trinity a sort of slippery fish of a doctrine. If you look at it just as a philosophical construction, as a model of 
ancient Greco-Roman Platonic and other concepts, in a way, it has a, a very unique genius because it combined what they perceived as the best of many worlds, including Jewish world of monotheism, and they combined it into this slippery fish of neither oneness or sabellianism, neither tritheism or three gods. After studying this for many, many years, this was done in purpose in efforts, as Schaff says, to exert a wholesome regulative influence on all these other dogmas of the ancient world. Land Carpenter, a noted English educator and Unitarian minister, says, if God is tri-personal, it cannot be said to be a person. You introduce nothing but confusion, for God's always described by the sacred writers as a person. When you speak of God being an intelligent agent, and at the same time deny him to be a person, you talk in a language not possible to be understood. Again, whether the terms essence and substance have the same signification or different things, I think of little importance and not worth a particular discussion. It's high time that all such metaphysical terms should be banished from Christian professions and Christian debates. <laughs>